it's, um, it's always a pleasure to be here, especially being able to uh, preach. That's, that is a, that's, that's really a blessing. And um, this week, uh, Sherry and I, well, Sherry and I haven't been here too long, and we'll be going back on the uh, 14th of October and, uh, to, to Honduras. Uh, and my son, I guess he's leaving the 4th. Uh, for Honduras, and this past week was a, a, a big mission conference in um, Cincinnati at First Baptist Church, and the uh, every seven years they bring all their member missionaries home, and uh, this was one of those years, and it's it's really enjoyable for us because we meet a lot of our friends that we've known over the years, and they they go out to different places in the world and. And uh, this is the third one they've had. I've been to all three of them. I'm not sure how many more I'm going to be to, but every seven years, so it's a long time. Uh, and I, uh, the, the thing there now is, you know, you look at the world, and um, I mean, you can't deny that we are in the end times. And uh, it's going to be a time to stand. That's what's going to be a time for it, not, not a time to back away. And it's not a time to fear either. God hasn't changed, and he doesn't want us to fear. Um, at the conference, uh, they had a time uh, each night of meeting the missionaries. It was just before all the preaching and that started. And we had a lot of missionaries, and they kind of, they divide up all these rooms. So Tuesday night, I was in this room, 210. And Wednesday night, Adam was in the same room, 210. So uh, when I got in the room, I said, well, uh, tomorrow night, Brother Jarvis is also going to be in a room, in this room, but I'm, uh, I'm the original one. He's the new and improved one. <laughs> so, so when I saw him afterwards, he, he's, uh, I think after he, had a, he, he asked me, he said, so uh, do you have a lot of people show up to your room? I said, it's filled. How about you? He says, it's filled. And I said, well, uh, I had people standing outside the door. And he goes, yeah, I did too. I said, well, there's people outside the door and they're moving around out there. And he says, well, they're just passing by going on to the next guy. So <laughs> we give each other a bad time, but it's, uh, uh, we, had a, we had a real good time there and it was a blessing. And I mentioned this morning that uh, a tremendous blessing was uh, we got while we were there. The church gave us, uh, we were, were going back to Roatan on the 14th. We had not tickets for it, back to Honduras, and, and uh, they gave a love offering to each one of the missionaries, and that love offering paid for those tickets, which I, as soon as I got, I went and paid the tickets, and so, so God is good. He's always good, and, and uh, uh, it's a blessing to, uh, to be able to tell you about these things, and, and this morning, I want to talk about something, um, if you would, uh, turn to Luke 10, and I'm going to talk about something about the Bible that is, uh, Called, we'll, we'll call it the mysteries of the kingdom. And verse 10, of, or Luke 10, starting in verse 23. I'm going to read 23 and 24. And he turned unto him his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, we do love you so very much, and we thank you for your mercy and for your goodness. We ask you to be here this day. We pray that, Lord, I pray that you would use me, Lord, to say what you want me to say, to whom you want me to say it. Uh, Lord, I, I know that each one of us goes through many different trials and temptations in our lives. And I, I pray that this day would be an encouragement to, to, to hear, to understand more about you. Lord, thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your love. And Lord, as always, we thank you for what you're doing and what you're going to do. And in Jesus' dear name we pray. Amen. Uh, we have a great advantage over uh, those that were in Old Testament times because we have the light of the New Testament that explains many things where uh, God has unlocked the secrets of life in his book. Now, he wrote this book for a purpose. It was for us, for his, his children, his adopted family, his, his family, that the kingdom that, 
the reason he died for. Uh, uh, if you want to put a, I like to put it this way as far as the purpose of all creation. So that God the Father could give God the Son a perfect bride. And, you know, in, and there's much more. Now, I, I'm, you know, we, it's much more than, well, I'll say the number one thing, most wonderful thing is that we're saved. Heaven is coming. We'll talk more about heaven that tonight. But uh, that, is a, that is a wonderful thing, and, and it's exciting. It's a, it's a gift that only that because of all Christ went through, we have that gift. But there are more things in the Bible about life here. We assume a lot of things because you get, you know, you're a Christian. Well, I'm going to go through a lot of hard times. People are going to, you know, mock me and, and life's not fair and those kind of things. But, but you know, I, I go to church and sometimes we, if you listen to the world, you're going to start questioning God and say, how come that guy got all that stuff? And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm serving God and, you know, I'm struggling. And, uh, of course, we sometimes forget that tenth commandment, which is do not covet. That's one of the things hard sometimes to forget about that. We start looking around and think we should have all these things. And, but, but there's more to life. There's more to, than the struggle of day to day just kind of grinding along. I mean you have before you, you have before you heaven. And that, that is, is a wonderful thing. And Well let me get back to these uh, secrets here. Uh, there are secrets in the Bible and I'm going to go through several of them here because uh, God explains these things. Now for instance, we'll take uh, Philippians 4.4, 4, which says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And you think, well, that's really hard to do. I mean, how can you do that? Well, the problem is, we try to find our own joyfulness. We try to find it. We, we, we think that, well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to church, but I, 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 can't, I can't be too I can't have too much of that. I want to be able to have fun. Can, I, can you see how the world has got you to think, well, the fun is not there. The fun's over here, what we're doing. And so uh, we don't understand that if you focus on God and honor him, he will give you that joy, his joy. He'll give it to you. Uh, that's, and that, that's something that we miss, and it's very, very important. I know a a friend uh, that I know, he had a business or uh, sold houses and stuff, and he went together with this Christian friend of his to buy a, I guess it was like one of these little shopping strip mall things. And, and one of the things, so they bought it together. They were partners in this. And uh, he said, well, I, I want to I make a point that the property here, and you can put that in uh, anybody who buys or rents in this thing, that you cannot sell alcohol because I'm a Christian. And the other guy said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, that's really nice and everything, but you know, if we get a, rest we get a restaurant here, and, you know, we and the rent for the restaurant would be, make a lot of money there, and if we say they can't sell alcohol, that's gonna hurt the business. He's, and the guy, this guy, his friend told him, he said, listen, church is one thing, business is another. And he said, right then I knew, Mm, this isn't going to work out. This was a mistake. And he said what he did is he turned around and he, he sold his part of the business. At a, he took a big loss and he let the guy have it. He speak, because you can't, what, what the guy was doing is, well, now, church is one thing, but business is money. And if I'm going to, that's what you have business for is to make money. And that is more important than church. And so we got to be, that's what the world keeps trying to get us, give us this thing, but let's get back to that verse about rejoicing. Uh, I want you to turn to Deuteronomy, because Deuteronomy says something here really important. And there's something I want you to understand, Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 28, because uh, it's, this is an issue. The Lord, when he talks, when he says things, sometimes he, uh, we're looking, we should always look for instruction in what God says. And these verses, uh, if you want to know what God wants of you, listen to what God... Now here, God is actually angry at these verses. But he tells them, and, and while he's angry, what they didn't do. 
And you can, if you, you understand, when you read verses, you always look and see, what is it? Why is God angry? And he explains in the verses why he did. Okay, uh, Deuteronomy 28, starting in verse, uh, I think it's 45. Or 40, well, uh, yeah, 45. Now, now, he's angry with Israel. He's telling them all these bad things are going to happen for what they didn't do. But I want you to listen to what he is saying here. He says, okay, moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever. Because, there's 47, thou servest, now he's angry saying this, but he's making a, a real important point. He says, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. He was mad at them, he was angry with them because they didn't serve God with joyfulness and gladness because God has given the abundance of all things. You know, and you might say, well, God didn't. I mean, I don't have the abundance of all things. I mean, there's a lot of things I don't have. And what, what, what are you saying you don't have? You look around. You see all the stuff other people have. And you think you should have that. No, he's given you, he's given you the opportunity. You know, you can have these things or you don't have these things. You know, uh, the Bible, the Bible, God says he will provide for you. And we, we want to try to do everything ourselves. It's, it's the problem we always have. We want to run the show. That's the way it's always, we want to run the show. That's why it's so hard to have faith, because you've got to trust God. You've got to let him go first. You've got to, you've got to make a step that you want to make you don't, in a place you don't want to put your foot. And God says, everything's going to be all right. Tell you what, when, uh, when Israel crossed, crossed the Jordan River on their way to Jericho, the priests had to step into the water. Foot had to be in the water, and then it would part. And at that time, that was harvest time, and those were overflowing at the banks. Those, those priests knew that if God didn't part that water, they very likely were straight on downstream. But they had to make a step of faith. And they stepped in the water. Praise the Lord. It parted just like God said it was going to do. Now, okay, so these treasures in the Bible, how do you find these things? If, if I told you, and Pastor, I think, gave something like this a while back, I remember this. That this field over here, uh, this field had $10 million in treasures buried all over the place. And you can, and there's a bunch of shovels there, you can go, go look for it. And you can dig, and if you find it, you keep it. And uh, the smaller treasures, the $1,000, they're only about a foot deep. The $5,000 treasures are about two feet deep. The $10,000 treasure is three feet deep. And you're thinking, man. And you go over and you start digging, and you have a little trouble. You say, okay, I've got to get organized here. I'm going to make a, I'm going to take this, this land. I'm going I'm to dig all the way across this way. Then I'm going to dig all the way down like this, and I'm going to set up in quadrants. And I'm going to go one, man, I'm going to dig, I'm going to dig a foot down, because that's the fastest way. I'll do that first. And I'll find some $1,000 treasure. And said, if you dig, you will find it. But the other ones, you have to dig deeper. You have to go farther down for the, so once you go through all the, once well, you dig another foot down after that, and you go and dig deeper, and then you get to 10,000 ones, you go, the Bible is like that. If you search, there are, there, there are blessings, there are secrets that he wants to give you that help you in your life. We, we struggle along sometimes. And although the Bible doesn't give you necessarily riches in money, give you riches in, you can become rich in love, in honor, in joy, in peace, in trust, faith, wisdom, blessings, contentment, rich in fellowship with God. I'll tell you something. These are, these are the things that people, that's why they make a lot of money. They want that. that they think the money is going to buy that for them. And it, and it won't. Okay, let's start out with one um, a particular secret that uh, you may not really be excited about this secret, but it's a secret of patience. And um, we like to joke about patience and say, man, don't pray for patience, because then I get these problems. And 
But Romans 5.3 says something really interesting about that. And we were talking a little bit about that earlier. Romans 5.3, God's word said, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Hmm, is that why we go through tribulations? We shouldn't complain to God because we have a problem in our, in our, our life, you know, our space is, God, is uncomfortable. I, wanna, I don't want it to be that way, God. God wants it in patience. Why patience? Why does God want you to have patience? Well, if you look at the uh, parable of the sower. Now, in, uh, we'll go back to Luke 8 here, but I want to talk, say something about this because it talks about patience and a purpose of, of uh, patience. Because we sometimes think that oh, there's, we miss the point of what God's doing and just complain to God and say, why do you make this happen? Okay, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some. Well, I'll just say that in, in the parable of the sower, uh, it talks about a, the sower casting seed, and the seed is the word of God. And some seed lands on the wayside. Some seed lands on the rock. Some seed lands among the thorns. And some seed lands on good ground. And it talks about that here. It explains the, the good ground. Now I'm going to skip down to, and, my, and I want to add something about this. The whole point here is about getting fruit. And only one of these four, there's any fruit. And it's the good ground. Now, if I ask everybody who's a Christian, what, what are you? And everybody would say, I'm the good ground. Because you want to be with the good guys, you know. You don't want to be one of the other ones. But look at uh, Luke uh, chapter 8, verse 15. But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. That's how you bring forth the fruit, with patience. I'd say it's pretty important right there, isn't it? By the way, I, I want to point something out. If you, it, it says in one of the other Gospels that uh, as far as the good ground, some brought 100, some brought 60, some brought 30. It doesn't say, and some brought none. It doesn't say that. It says bringing fruit. So this is, very, this is an important thing about, about so patience. You want to have patience. Hebrews, Hebrews 10.36. I'll just read this to you. For we have need of patience, that after we have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Patience is, is something that's important, and it comes through tribulations. And, and, it, and Ron was saying, right, you need to learn to have patience. It's important. It's important to God. It's important to being a Christian. God, you know, it's very difficult without patience to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish. So this is an important thing. Okay. Uh, so that's patience. But there's other, how about the secret of prosperity? Man, everybody likes prosperity. I want to be, prosper I want to be prosperous. I want to do that. Okay. Okay. Um, God does this. This is another one people, everybody, it's kind of a common one. You think everybody knows, but it's extremely important. Okay, turn to Malachi, which is, you know, go to the New Testament and back up. It's the last chapter in the Old Testament. Okay, Malachi 3, starting in verse 9. And it says, or let's go with verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And 11 says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time of the fields, saith the Lord of hosts. God is explaining a, a principle here that he is telling you he wants you to tithe. 
Now, ever hear the statement, people say, well, 90% will go farther than 100%. Now, the world really laugh about that. But God says here, he says, prove me, prove me to see what I, what I will do. And then verse 11 reminds you what happens if you don't. Because if you do, he rebukes the devourer for your sakes. And what's the devourer do? He takes away. You, you, it's like having holes in your pockets, things oh, I, can't, I can't afford. And usually a devourer takes more than a tithe. God gets his tithe. If he has to take it through the devourer, or else if you give it. But if you give it, he blesses you for that. And see, that helps us not to hold up money as an idol. That's, that's very, very important. Um, I always thought it was great that on the money in the United States, I don't know of any other currency, on every coin and on every dollar bill or, and paper money, it says, in God we trust, to remind us that isn't the idol. God is. Okay, going on here, the secret of godliness. Everybody wants to be godly. Uh, and I'm going to give you one verse. And it's, a, and it's kind of a, you know, people want to, it's one of those verses, you know, there's a couple of verses in the Bible. I, I, well, I won't go on. I'll just tell you in a moment here about that, but but it's one of these verses that uh, it's difficult for some people to understand. Well, the secret of godliness, 1 Thessalonians 5.22. And the verse says, abstain from all appearance of evil. You think, man, what? You know what? And, you know, you think, well, if somebody says, hey, I don't think you should do that. You say, well, who do you think you are? You know, you don't judge me. And, you know, they go on all about that. But God is the one who said this, abstain from no appearance of evil. Now what's that? Well, it's, it's stepping close to evil when you, when you um, it's like, okay, if I walk up to the end of the stage like this, some people look down and say, man, his feet are hanging over the edge, I hope he doesn't fall. You know, it makes people nervous because I'm close to the edge. Now, I've been to the Grand Canyon. I remember a place there, I could walk, I could, if I wanted to, you could walk right up to a a rock cut down like this, look over the side, and a thousand feet down the rock down there. Now, I didn't stand like this. I would think I was laying on my stomach looking over the edge. But to walk up to the edge of that, I mean, it's safe. Yeah, you're not, I mean, it's safe, solid ground. But you're, you're foolish. You're stepping too close to the evil. You know, and... Uh, uh, in Proverbs 7, it talks about a, a young man void of understanding. He went the way to her house, and it's talking about the harlot here. And uh, it says, as it, as it went on, he went to the house, and it says, With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield, and with the flattering of her lips, she forced him. Now, from these verses right here, it's as if this guy didn't intend on what happened to happen, but he got too close. And it says, and it, then you keep reading on this, it says, for she had cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. And you know what? He was no match for her. He was no match for sin. And when you step up close to it, and you say, hey, I'm too spiritual. I can handle it. Man, Satan has got you then. I, I know good people that have fallen and that you, you, just, you just don't mess around. Stay back from the edge. Yeah, you're still safe, but stay back from the edge. It's just a, uh, and so I believe that that verse, God was saying it, so that you wouldn't get the temptation being that it looks like to everybody else. Because usually if it looks that way, you're feeling it. All right. And, uh, okay, let's go on here with uh, the secret of answered prayer. Well, this is something uh, I always like to talk about that, but it's uh, in 1 John 3.22. I've always felt that was one really a good verse that talks about this because it gives you an understanding about God and what he wants. 
And what you're going to find out in all these things, what God's looking for is you honor God, he'll honor you. That's what it's always come down to, always. And this verse isn't any different. It says, 1 John 3, 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. If you ever wonder what's pleasing in God's sight, you certainly know what isn't pleasing in God's sight. We all know that. And God wants you, God wants you if you do these things, I am telling you, you've never had a friend. You have made God your friend. You never had a friend like that. He can do anything. Do you know that God, David was God's friend, man after his own heart. And God blessed descendants of David not that they necessarily deserved it, but because of, for David's sake, he loved David. Wouldn't, wouldn't you like your children to be blessed because of you, whether they deserve it or not? Because God looked at you as his friend. I've always said that if you, you want to, you pray for your children, you pray they you know, marry the right person, they, you know, not, get in, not get into bad things happening and all that. So the best way you can do that is there's a better way even than prayer to make a friend with God. And he knows the desires of your heart. And he wants to give it to you. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Very important, John 14, 15. All right. Uh, there's a verse, and I, I smile because I've said many times, I'd start out and say, okay, does everybody believe the Bible is true? Yes, amen, praise God. And there's nothing in it, but God wrote it, everything it says is true. Right, amen, praise God, hell you. Okay, how about Proverbs 22, 6? Raise up a child, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. Somebody goes, uh, wait a minute, now, you know, I know this person, and they're really a good person, and you know, they... And I actually had a pastor's wife who told me, I just don't think that verse is true. <laughs> what? Because they had a problem with a child, and, and they, you know, they felt they did everything. But the key here to that verse is the first word, train. Who does the training? Do you know who's supposed to do it? Parents. Yes. Good Christian school is a good thing. You can't say, well, a man at best or slave ball would have preached more about that sin. I child wouldn't have fallen it, you know. I mean, no, it's the parent. Now, I want to, uh, now there's a lot, the Bible says a lot about training children, but I want you to turn to Deuteronomy 6. This is something that, um, uh, I, you know, when, when, whenever I read the Bible, I always, I always look for things that, uh, what is God? First thing was, what pleases God? I really had that in my mind when I read. And then I found a whole pile of things. But here, Deuteronomy 6. Let me get to my... Deuteronomy 6, verses... And once you, once you read this, then you... Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 through 7. And I'll read. God's word says... And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. That's you, by the way. That's what you're supposed to be doing here. And it's 6 says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and, they shall, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. What are you saying here? This is part of your life. You talk about God. It, and that, by the way, in a few minutes I'm going to talk to you about something, how, how important that is of talking about God a lot in your child's life. You want your child to be trained up. You, that's part of your training. Yes, you take them to a good church. Yes, you have them have, try to get good things in front of them and that. But it comes down to you. It's your responsibility to talk to them during the day and at night and and encourage them and strengthen them up in the Lord. Um, and so if you, uh, um, uh, training up a child is not an easy thing. It requires a lot of work. But consider the alternative. God gives us, and, and our time on this earth, and I'll, 
I'll talk about that tonight. But the time on it isn't to see how much fun we can have. It isn't to fill some bucket list. Because, man, you're going to be dying pretty soon, so you want to make sure you climb Mount Everest or something. I actually know a pastor who did that. He was 50, 54 years old when he did it. And he lived. His wife said, he just wanted to die. He just wanted to die. She was telling me that. He's telling me, wow, look at my plaque I got. And, and then she was responding, you know, he just wanted to die. Anyway, so he built the, you know, I don't think she was too impressed with the plaque. But uh, anyway, um, okay. So raising children. Secret of provision. Um, there's something that, you know, we want to be able to, and, and God promises that his children will not starve. But if you look at Matthew 6.33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The verse is talking about what previously was said. It's talking about food and clothing, uh, the needs that you have. And it says, seek ye first. It doesn't mean seek, start worrying about your clothes and all that kind of stuff. God knows that's a need you have. But seek first the kingdom of God. Because when you do that, and God, by the way, he doesn't say, and then you can work for it. No, he says it will be added unto you. God will make sure you get it. He will take care of you. But first, it's him. First, kingdom of God. First, you focus on God in your life, in your time. And uh, our lives, by the way, are not that long. Um, the Bible refers to him as a vapor. Good night, I'm telling you. That, that it is, and I'll talk more about that tonight. I'm going to be talking about those kind of things. Okay. Um, turn to Psalm 112. I love this psalm. This is a, a favorite of mine. It tells about a lot of things that are going to happen in these, I think there's 10 verses in it. And uh, about, but the first verse explains why you're reading the next nine verses. Psalm 112 says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. Now, now see that word? There's two words, delighteth greatly. He's someone who likes the word of God. He loves the word of God. He understands that God's commandments are not bad, not something to keep you into a corral. It's something that protects you. It's a protection because he knows what you don't know. And you think sometimes you can deal one-on-one -on -one with Satan. You can't. He will win every time. Satan knows when he's got you. I remember I had a, uh, my, my younger brother is a, is a, uh, works in a prison. He's um, and he said he came to visit us one time in El Paso, and we had a group down there from, I don't know what the church was. And he said, you know, I could tell you, I could just point out which one of these kids I'm going to see again in prison. I, he said, I could just point, I could just tell by their attitude now that, that an attitude that has not been curbed by parents or anybody, that that attitude is going to get them, get them into trouble. But uh, so anyway, what, God, what God's looking for, okay, let's keep reading this, because praise you, Lord, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth great in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. Verse 7, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Wouldn't you like to not be afraid of things that keep coming on every day? God, I'm telling you, God, this book shows you how to do that. Life without worry. That's, that is not a, something that's just an imagination of the sky. That is true. Eight, his heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees his enemies, see his desire upon his enemies. He hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Right. These little ten verses, 
So there's a lot of things that are going to happen to someone who honors God, who, de who delighteth greatly to understand that God is good. He loves you. He created, died. All he did, he did for you, and he did it because he loves you. Don't let anybody imagine, imagine in your mind, don't let anybody make you imagine in your mind that God is angry with you and he's, he wants to just ca cast his wrath upon you. Do you know why? Because all of God's wrath for every sin committed was put upon Jesus on the cross. All of it. He didn't save some for you later. i poke you with a pin. It all went on Jesus. That's why Jesus, um, before he went there, he knew what was coming. And he said, if there is some other way, Lord, but not my will, yours be done. We don't understand how much God loves us, how much he bears with us, but he won't force you. You make the final choice. But he's given all this information. If you follow this, you will be blessed. You can have a victorious Christian life. Now, while there's a, how about a secret to sinning less? I don't want to sin less, man. Um, when I was in El Paso, um, I remember a guy came up to me and he said, after one of the mission trips weeks, he said, man, he said, is it easier here not to sin? And, uh, and I, he's talking about here, because in your mind is where, you, you know, it's where Satan's always trying to go. And he wasn't the only guy that said that to me. Uh, when I, uh, not long ago, a couple weeks ago, we had Thanksgiving. My family all came together, went over to Tanya's house, had a wonderful time, had a big old turkey. Man, it was great. My favorite, the turkey is one of my favorite. And we ate till my brains fell out, you know, and I had all this food. It was so good. I mean, it was so good. When I finished that meal, now occasionally when I travel, I'll stop at um, fast food places like Taco Bell once in a while. And I remember driving by a Taco Bell thinking, yeah, that I can't imagine because I wasn't hungry. I was full. And uh, I have... Uh, uh, I've, you know, kids, I see them when we travel on Mexico and other places, people digging through the trash. And in um, Honduras, one of the kids got to digging in the trash and found a partial stale peanut butter and jelly sandwich that they brushed all the coffee grains off and ate it because they were hungry. Now, other kids, uh, uh, my son had them and, and bought one of these uh, microwave pop popcorn things, pass out to the kids. They had all popcorn, and one of the kids ate the bag because it tasted good, because he was hungry. And he eats the, you, you take the evil comes in because you're hungry. But the bread of life, if you fill yourself with that, then you're not hungry for the sin of the world. When, and, and that's when I, was, when I was talking about El Paso. We, we wake up in the morning, we had a schedule. Okay, you prayed and you got up. Okay, we pray. And then we get up and go put Bibles together. And then we have, get preached to and we pray some more. We go into Mexico, we pray before we get in there. And when we're in there, we pray that God will come and take care of us and bless the meeting. And we'll pray for whatever storm, whatever's going on. We pray about that. We pray all the time. And you come at the end of the week and everybody's so happy. They would tell me, man, when I go down to El Paso, the fire was lit in me. Man, I'm coming next year because the fire went out during the year. Well, it's because they stopped doing what they were doing there. They went back to their life. And they said, oh, well, you know, I don't need, uh, I got work and I don't need, I don't pray in the morning and I don't really spend time with God each day and like I was doing there. And boy, but sure is nice there. Boy, you guys really, the fire you got there. And I said, the fire's not here. It was within you because you changed the way your relationship with God. That's what we do. We spend time and, and this world mocks you. They mock you for being a Christian, they, and it's not easy being a Christian in the world. I, I know in the high school, sometimes the, the kids that are in high school, if they're not, if they live there as a, or, or anybody finds out that they're Christian and that they're virgins, they say, well, you're either, if you're a virgin, you're either ugly or you, uh, you're some kind of Bible fanatic. And they mock the kids. Very, very difficult in the schools. Public school is a very, very, very difficult place to 
children to grow up. But the world wants you to, the world hates you, not you as a Christian, but God. That's who they hate. And he said that's what was going to happen, and it does happen. Um, and by the way, these secrets we're talking about, you can't have those secrets without being saved. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches you. A lot of people have read the Bible. And they'll, they'll tell you, know a lot of things about it. The Pharisees, man, they could quote it. They memorized things, but they, but they weren't saved because they did it for their own glory. They wanted to, their pride, they, they, that's how they lived out their life. They didn't understand when Jesus talked about taking care of the poor and all those things. They didn't understand any of that. The Holy Spirit is what teaches you and who teaches you. You can have these secrets that the Bible wants. All you have to do, and you can have this good, this victory on earth. You can change your life for the better. You just need to spend time in the book. If you're willing to look, you'll find the treasures. Our God is a good God. has good things. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, we love you so much and we thank you for your mercy and for your love. And Lord, I, my prayer is that uh, people here would understand more of how much you love them, how much you have given for them, how much you have showed the way. But you wrote a book, only one book. Only of all the millions of books in the world, you only wrote one. And Lord, it was to each one of us for our health, for our welfare. God, help us to honor you with what we do, what we say, what we think. Help us to come closer to you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. As always, we thank you for what you're going to do. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand with our heads bowed. Lisa is going to begin playing. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Secrets of Scripture, the treasures of God's Word. What is it that uh, the Lord spoke to you this morning? There's a lot packed in, to about 35, 40 minutes there. The altar's open. Have you let evil come in because you're hungry? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this uh, truth from your word, the nuggets of uh, truth that uh, we need to remember every day. I pray that uh, we would uh, continue to dig into your word, Lord. And God, I pray that we would take something this morning and uh, take it with us the remainder of this day and uh, make it, uh, allow it to change our lives. We thank you for being so good to us and giving us your precious word. I pray that we would just uh, hold to it tight. Lord, allow it to change our lives. We thank and we praise you. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing.
I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. If um, uh, Make sure and come back tonight. Uh, Brother Jarvis has, uh, will be uh, again uh, preaching this evening. Looking forward to that. But let's sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God as we're dismissed. All right? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by <coughs> joint tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of